So thank you all for joining us. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce Bill Anderson. He's the Marketing Technology Solutions Architect at DemandSpring. <clears throat> and he will be presenting what I learned from my first implementation. So without further delay, Bill, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, great. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. And um, I had some problems earlier that the slides didn't advance. So if you don't see the slides advancing immediately into some a white slide, let me know right away. Uh, yell out, please. <clears throat> Here we go. So I'm Bill Anderson. I'm Marketing Technology Solutions Architect at DemandSpring. I'm actually a full-time consultant at a consultancy. Um, most of the companies that I work for, um, I work with companies around the world, particularly focused on technology, software, uh, financial services, industries. Much of who I work with is small to medium enterprises. So I'll be, my talk will be focused on the corporate environment um, with maybe a few hundred employees or more. Some companies are really well run. Some make very complicated systems that are hard to maintain. Today, I'll be talking to you on some very high level observations about you and your job, communicating with teams and reducing errors. The first thing that I learned was don't do two jobs. I had no idea what I was getting into, and I was, a, you know, I was working full time as a graphic designer and marketing guy, and then I expected this to be like a typical static brochure site, where you just set up the parameters and let the contact contractors do the rest. Uh, I had no idea how incredibly demanding it was all to do all the upfront planning and all of the data. Um, so it was actually I thought I was going to just push buttons and have fun, and it was you know, pretty, pretty demanding. So ask yourself, what kind of data do I need to bring in to make this work properly? <clears throat> Who needs to be involved? Some of the people that need to be involved are, uh, you have your marketing managers, you might have a sales operations uh, person, they're usually like a Salesforce admin. Um, you want to have people like uh, your Sales development reps, those are the people who telequalify and who are on the phone with uh, prospects and decide if they're actually going to be passed over as leads. So if you can talk to those people, they are going to be able to help you decide what a good lead looks like. And also, you have to start thinking about, well, will this scale? Your consultant is not a crutch. You cannot simply hand the demand generation development machine off to these uh, to a person um, they they simply won't understand how your business works the way you do they do have good experience and it's great to bounce ideas off them but they don't some of the stuff that they come up with don't always fit everyone's situation so in my case my consultant had uh, brought in he imported several scoring campaigns that were designed more for retail and so you know that if a consumer aged out then they would get lower points but the problem is business to business sales are often 18 months three years or longer and so if you have programs like this suddenly some of your best leads have you know negative 700 points what's going on well this stuff was just mismatched it's very important that you talk about results I have an odd analogy here, but your clients and your clients are the executives, they're your marketing managers, your demand generation managers, your, um, your sales teams. Put yourself in their shoes. What do they want solved? Okay. They don't care about things like they don't care about programming language. They don't care about containers. They don't care about databases or any of that. What they care about is they care about the problems that they need to solve. So, and sometimes they don't know what those problems are. So you need to put yourself in their shoes. And sometimes you, what you need to do is you need to look beyond uh, their immediate need and see what they're actually asking that's behind it. <clears throat> the analogy I use about tech is a wedding DJ. Now, if you do a search on wedding DJs, you always get images like this. This is a classic example, right? They're showing cool technology. They got computers, they got wires, they got speakers, they got lights. It's really awesome. But families don't care about that. What family care about is 
They want to know, can I trust you? Will you create a beautiful day? Will my family have fun? Will my reception be memorable? Or will you embarrass me? Okay, this is marketing technology. People don't care about this. The, the, the salespeople, the, 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 the executives, they care about this. Will you get the results that I need? Okay, if you do a search, um, if you do a search on image search for wedding DJ, you'll see this, right? And this is a perfect example. So we know that there's a bunch of lights. Everybody, all DJs love purple lights for whatever reason. Um, and they show equipment, they show stuff like that. Very few of them actually show the results. Okay, I excluded things that were magazine photos. I just focused on the actual. So you can see out of the sea of lookalikes, very few people are talking results. And that's what you need to do. You need to talk results when it comes time to um, talk to your executives and your sales teams. I suggest you form a feedback team. The feedback team, the salespeople know what a good lead looks like. Marketing often thinks they do, but they don't. Salespeople are extremely busy. They're also really competitive. They will give you very harsh feedback. They may not trust you because they're traditionally trained that marketing just creates fluff and you know, marketing keeps the beer cold. But once you show prove yourself to them that you can pass good leads and accept tough feedback when you send bad leads, then uh, you know you will have a much better dialogue with them. So don't be embarrassed to, to have a difficult conversation with them. Meet regularly. If you're in a big team, if they, you have a big sales team, then you know maybe you can meet quarterly. If you have a good sales development rep, SDR manager or BDR manager, business development rep, the people who telequalify leads and then pass them on to, to salespeople. Maybe you can meet with them weekly and they can tell you what's working and what's not. Don't rely on tools instead of real communication. You know, um, salespeople are tough, they're competitive. So there are difficult conversations to be had. People in departments have to change quite a bit. People don't like to change. Automation only really works if sales is consistent or if, if working the leads and working the data is consistent. So the worst thing that I see is when marketing teams are afraid to, um, to have these difficult conversations and to you know under, make people understand why it's important for them to work consistently, then what they'll do is they'll create complex workarounds to avoid that confrontation. And then that creates a more increasingly complex system that's really hard to maintain. People think that, uh, you know, sending emails is cheap and easy, but the reality is I see too many of these in my inbox on a regular basis. People just pumped out an email. They did it fast. They didn't pay attention. This is expensive. If you send to the wrong people, you're going to spend days figuring out who you sent to and have to resend an apology letter like this. You embarrass yourself and your team in front of executives. These are always very high profile mistakes. These are expensive. Okay. You can avoid that by throwing a launch party. A launch party, in my opinion, is a great thing because what it does, it gets everyone in the room. I like to get the designers, the copywriters, the marketing managers, I and you know, it might be on Zoom or whatever, but what you're doing is you're telling, okay, phones down, laptops closed, pay attention right now. And then what we do is we review all the content, we walk through the links, we walk through all the workflows, and we make sure that everybody in the room is paying attention to their particular contribution, okay? <clears throat> I also walk through the logic, and I think that that's extremely important. Uh, I once learned about Japanese conductors and what you'll see with Japanese conductors is they will point and they will speak as they do things. And the reason they're doing that is because they found that it focuses your attention. Um, you, you know, so by, and with a train conductor or anyone in that, you know, in, in public transportation, a moment's inattention can be catastrophic. And so, the conductors have found that physically pointing and speaking focuses your mind and body on the task at hand. So you can adapt that to 
reduce errors in your logic by talking through the logic. I like to speak the logic out loud in full sentences. I speak every part of the workflow and the logic, and I'll uncover, I'll uncover errors because you'll see that somebody will have pointed, they'll say, okay, so if they filled out a form, I want them to do this, <clears throat> but they'll have pointed it to the wrong website, or they selected, they wanted somebody who didn't fill out something, but the logic is they did, and, and they can't dig through it if they're just flipping through it really fast. Now, if you think about it, when you are building your lists and you are building your programs, you're actually building algorithms and miniature programs using drag and drop programming. So it really pays for you to work through this. When you're walking through a chart like this, if you speak it out loud, it becomes much more obvious where you have a flaw. So if I, you know, when I have the sample segment, I pull up the sample segment. I look at the logic that's behind the sample segment. I show the marketing manager, are these the right people? I might show the sales teams, are these your people? And then I'll say, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna send, you know, I'm gonna send Stephanie a text message. I'm gonna send Stephanie an email. If she opens the email, I'm going to add three points. If she clicks the email, I'm gonna add her to the test segment and so on and so on. And so by doing that, you can uncover any uh, issues or mistakes that you have. Um, and again, if we have any questions. So that is pretty much the typical speed that I work through a presentation. And uh, that's why I always wind up with a lot of, a lot of free time on my hands. So it looks like there are no questions. I'll ask myself a question. So what are the biggest challenges that you face when you introduce marketing automation into a, um, into a company? And I think the biggest question is getting people to understand the mental model that's around that. Uh, getting people to understand that it's not just pushing a button and sending things out. There's a lot of data and a lot of uh, lead flow that you have to consider before you do that. Uh, do I have another question? I think that's about it. I don't know, Stephanie, is there anything else? Let's see if I can get presenter a uh, slide. I don't have anything else, but I guess maybe I have a few questions. Okay, sure. <laughs> so as a marketer, um, we're obviously trying to hit a lot of different people on our lists. Yeah. Um, so how do you suggest in terms of the personalization piece, like, I guess um, you kind of talked about, like, you could easily lose a customer and that's actually expensive. Yep. Um, right. so what do you think is like, to, what is a good cadence um, kind of for sending these notes? Is it once a week? Like, what do you see um, that yeah. works well for organizations? That's a really great question. So I have a lot of clients that we build out you know, multi-touch or multi-stage engagement programs for them. Uh, some, some of them, some of them will vary depending on where they are in the buying cycle. So, if you are top of the funnel and you are new and just learning about a product, you might get something twice a week. And then, if you're in the middle of the funnel and you're looking at, you know, some of the more technical issues and buying patterns and and you know, what I need to do, and there might be cost comparison charts and things like that, they might slow that down to once a week or so. And then, uh, you know, or many, you know, so, and they'll experiment, they'll, 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 you know, and then finally, if they don't buy, then they'll put them in a recycle program, where you may get something once every two weeks, or even once a month, depending on how they age out. So you can vary that speed. Uh, and you can experiment too. So there's a lot of experiments with time of day that they're sending as well as cadence. I do have some that will send, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for example. Um, but the problem with that is you have to have a ton of content or, you know, they age out really quickly and then they get nothing. So you need to balance that as well. That makes sense. Yeah. What do you currently see as um, maybe the best time of day to send an email? Um, maybe let's say US and then let's say like Europe. Yeah, so 
Tuesday mid-morning is always a great time, but when people figure that out, then it, that becomes really crowded. <laughs> I even have some companies right now that are looking at like Friday morning just because it's nobody's thinking about it then, so they might just squeeze it in, you know, uh, even Sunday nights. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, we actually have a question from Danko. Yep. He said, I find it often difficult to track the lead source of leads that came by calling or being yep. sent an email. Are there any best practices? Yes, that is a, that is a great question. And it's often a big problem. Uh, with email, you should be able to create a lead source as you process the, uh, you know, the call to action links as it comes in. You can create in Modic, you can create pieces that say if someone clicked a link, then mark them with this lead source, give them points, and so on. That's really easy um, compared to trying to trying to do that with a phone call. If there's an inbound call and you don't have uh, a telemarketing technology hooked up, then it becomes really complicated because you need your uh, you need your BDRs, your business development reps, to manually work that and say, can you add this? When you're adding your notes, make sure that you record that, you know, someone had called in um, and where they came in from. So I think, sorry, just two things there is if you're using UTM codes, you know, or universal tracking codes on uh, all of your links and even your email links, then it's much easier to de determine marketing or attribution. Um, but when it comes to physical interactions like phone calls and uh, uh, you know in-person events, then it becomes much harder. Um, that's awesome. And that was a really good question, Dango. Yeah, it was. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that sales will know what a good lead is and marketing sometimes does not, yeah. which I would actually agree with. Yeah. Um, something that I find to be a hot lead, I send over to the sales team when they're just kind of like, nah. <laughs> so how can marketers, you know, be better at, yeah. you know, kind of verifying these leads um, before we send them over to the sales team? Do you have yeah. any tips? You know, uh, the biggest thing that I'm learning this year, I don't know what it is about this year, but I'm amazed at how many marketing teams are afraid of salespeople, right? Because you think about it, salespeople are tough. They're competitive. They throw elbows, right? They're not afraid to tell you, hey, this thing stinks. And, you know, marketers, we're, we're all kind of like mildly introverted at some point, especially marketing operations people. So they're like, uh, right? And you can't do that. Like they're giving you this feedback. It may be tough to take but they're telling you exactly what they need. And then if you can take that and turn that into data points, then you're gonna to start to eventually feed them gold. And that's what they need. You know, and to the tough conversations, uh, I have some that, for example, I have some people who their sales teams want any click. So if you, if you clicked a link on a webinar or you downloaded a book, you immediately go to sales. And then salespeople say, this is junk. Why are you sending me this? So then the marketers go in between that. And every morning they go and they try to clean out the junk leads. But the marketers should be saying, listen, you can't have your, you can't have it all. You either, you know, you wait one or two touches until you get a qualified lead, or you're going to have to accept that you're going to get a lot of junk leads, but you can't have it both ways. And that's a difficult conversation to have, especially with super competitive people. <laughs> right. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Bill. Yeah. Let's see. I think that might be all of our questions. Okay. Well, thanks for rolling with us on the uh, technical difficulties. My pleasure. Um, you have a great presentation. Again, we really appreciate all of your insights. So thanks for sharing. Awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Mautic is awesome. I just think this is the greatest thing ever. And the community is super, super cool. So I'm glad I could give back. Yeah, we at Acquia yeah. totally agree. We yeah. are loving Mautic. So. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. And I, I think it has tremendous advantages for particularly like nonprofits and 
uh, you know, startups and things like that. I think this is just a, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing for nonprofits. So that's where I'm going to focus a lot of effort on. Give awesome. people a voice, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Bill. All right. Nice to meet you. Take care. You as well. Bye-bye.